Welcome to Have It Out with Galloway, where I get to talk to the most interesting guests. And uniquely, you get to talk back to me, thanks to the wonders of our video wall. It turns out the only red lines around Rafa were the rivers of blood of the women, children, men who are being slaughtered there, literally as I speak. Israel has seized the Philadelphia Corridor and therefore the gate out of Gaza into Egypt in complete defiance of the Camp David Accords. I told you they were a bad idea. And Egypt's sovereignty can be added to the long list of casualties of this latest chapter in the 76-year Calvary of the Palestinian people at the hands of uh, the colonialist apartheid idea called Zionism. In the tent city of Rafa, 1.6 million people are literally being torn to shreds, no longer buried under the rubble. There's no more rubble left to fall. The tracer bullets, the rockets and the bombs are cutting like a knife through butter through the tents and through the millions of refugees trapped inside. It is a catastrophe, a Nakba, and the Western leaders are paralyzed, steeped in blood so far, they have no idea whether it is bloodier to go on or to go back, waiting for orders from a drooling imbecile in the White House, no longer sure where he is, which country even he is in. And it's not just Rafa. Jabalia, you remember that camp I told you about so many times that I know so well over more than 40 years. They said the Palestinian resistance in the camp had been dismantled, had been destroyed. In which case, why are they bombing it again remorselessly day and night? Children, amputees, without anesthetic, women, desperately sick, without medicine or any possibility of medical attention. Well over 150,000 people either murdered or maimed or lost under the rubble. I'll tell you what else is lost under the rubble. The moral authority, such as it was, of the so-called democratic, so-called free world. Although their media choir is still singing Alleluia in praise of our dwarfish thieves that hang about the robes like a dwarfish thief, the media are not able to drown out the chorus of disapproval, anger, and grief that is arising from inside the Western countries, millions upon millions of them. These politicians and their media prostitutes are going to be damned in history forever. And that history began today. Now, the war is going extremely badly for NATO in the Ukraine also. Just in the last four days, 252 square kilometers on the Kharkov front, 52 miles long, have been taken from the regime, now illegitimate, unelected regime in Kiev. The fortifications that Western taxpayers paid billions of pounds to build turn out not to have been built, and the billions are in the Cayman Islands or other offshore tax avoidance gigs. The Ukrainian regime, which we were told had to win, would win, a beach party in the Crimea was promised for last summer here in the early summer sunshine. The new world is heaving into view. On Thursday of this week, President Putin will be going to Beijing, his first overseas trip since his triumphant re-election as the president of Russia. The Chinese leadership are then coming back 
to Moscow with him after the summit in Beijing. Something's up. It's the new world coming into view. Now, you can take a view on everything I've said after you've heard our quite outstanding first guest. It's then your turn on the video wall. Tarek Ramadan is Emeritus Professor at the University of Oxford. He's an academic, a philosopher, king, a writer, known for his contributions to contemporary Islamic studies. He's advocated for a progressive understanding of Islam and its relevance in the modern world. Very good to see you again, Professor, after too long. Uh, let's begin with Gaza, if we may. They all said there was a red line over Rafa, around Rafa. They all said the Camp David Accords back in 1978 were the foundation stone of Arab-Israeli peace. They all said that they would not countenance an invasion of the tent city of Rafa. But the only red I can see on the map is the blood. How does it look to you? Yes, thank you again, uh, uh, George, for your invitation. I think that we have heard it was said, and at the end, what we said from the very beginning is that the red line was from the very beginning, starting this massacre in Gaza. So Rafa is just an ongoing process of uh, a fascist government in Israel, not listening to the world, not listening to anything which was said, from South Africa, from the, 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 the Court of Justice and and uh, even the United States. So, so we heard from the United States, it's the red line. But at the same time, they are saying, we are going to uh, give up selling you some of the weapons that we are selling you. So it's a joke and it's a bad joke. It's an, an acceptable way of dealing with Israel and with the government. And, and I think that what is happening now is... Uh, Rafa is the, 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 the logical uh, move uh, towards what uh, Netanyahu said from the very beginning. We are go it's going to take long, it's going to last, and we are going to destroy, and we are going to go to our objectives. And this is exactly what he is doing while we are witnessing the, the unacceptable. Rafa is unique in one sense, though. It is literally the border. It's a border town, a sleepy little town. I've been in it many, many times, long before it was almost two millions uh, of people living in desperate uh, struggle to avoid uh, the bombs and the rockets, which are now, of course, falling on Rafa. But its significance, therefore, and the significance of the seizing of the Philadelphia corridor is that Israel now controls that gate and only has to open that gate and machine gun the 1.6 million refugees there, stampede them into the Sinai. It would be biblical uh, if it were not actually hell on earth. Yes, you are right. It's it's very specific. But at the same time, you are saying now Israel is controlling uh, Rafah. Uh, and to tell you the truth, uh, Israel has been controlling Gaza for the last uh, 18 years. That's the reality. Now that uh, the logic of what they had started on the 8th of October uh, is to go as far as they can. And no one is preventing them from doing this. And even, I'm sorry to say, what we got from uh, Egypt and what we got from the so-called uh, allies to the peace process or the ceasefire is not helping the Palestinians to get uh, uh, an answer here because from the very beginning this would have been uh, uh, not accepted at all and, and the clear red line should have been set by the Egyptian at the same time. So the fact that they are not respecting Camp David uh, uh, agreement, this is just, they are not even, you know, anyone who is opposing their uh, policies and their objectives is now be perceived 
perceived as an anti-Semite. This is for the individuals and even the institutions because the uh, 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 United Nations is uh, now an anti-Semite organization. So it's the logical process of what we have been uh, seeing. So yes, it's specific. And what we know is that the logic of killing, and, and let me tell you something, we are only counting and re referring to children. I'm sorry, these are innocent people, men, women, and children are being killed. And it's an ongoing process not to uh, forget the wounded in the whole process. With your knowledge of Egypt, uh, will Egypt oppose any attempt to stampede the refugees into the Sinai Desert? I think that uh, it's an in-between. It's going step by step because what we heard from Egypt is that they're starting, uh, they started uh, uh, organizing a, a, an in-between camp for getting some people there. So it might be that uh, there is an agreement between Egypt and Israel about some of them being uh, step by step being. Uh, 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 transferred to uh, the Sinai. This could happen. This could happen because this is exactly what is uh, in the mind of the Israeli government, is to move the people and to take control of uh, Gaza at different levels and uh, in different steps. So so I think it's, an, it's a step-by-step -step strategy, but I would say that we have to stop being naive about the relationship between Egypt and Israel as to what is happening now, because if there was not uh, uh, some agreements, it would have been impossible for Israel to do what they are doing now. So, so let us be clear on this. And, and my point on this is that, you know, it's very courageous to condemn what Israel is doing, but it's more courageous now to come with what we stand for. What do we want exactly from what is happening now? It's not only to, the ceasefire, of course, is the first step, but what do we want And in this to condemn Israel or to condemn, you know, killing the civilians uh, uh, by Hamas? That's one point. But now what is the future? What is our uh, take on this? And, and I think that our voices around the world are not strong enough. And maybe the worst uh, allies for the Palestinians now is the lack of courage of, of uh, Western leaders and some even, you know, Muslim Western leaders being very quick to condemn and very slow to propose. Well, you're the philosopher, uh, the great towering intellectual. What should we be demanding? What should we be saying must be the future? I, I think that uh, uh, we need to have a, a holistic approach to, to the process. But yes, we have to start uh, asking for ceasefire immediately. But at the same time, we have from where we are in what you are doing yourself, George, in the UK, but uh, throughout the world, we need to have voices now asking for a clear uh, 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 position towards uh, Israel and uh, stop selling the, the, the weapons, stop the relationship, and, and to be clear about what we want for uh, the Palestinians there. And we can't avoid, even though we want a political uh, solution, we need to talk about religion, we need to talk about what do we want. And from a religious viewpoint, from an Islamic viewpoint, to start by saying anti-Semitism is anti-Islam. This is not our way. What we want is a country where Jews, Christians and Muslims and people of no faith and no religion could live together. So the one state solution, the, it's, it's essential. And for the people who are telling this, but by saying this, you are against the very specific Jewish state to say, if the Jewish state means that you want to discriminate all the others, that's not acceptable. And we need to have voices coming together. But we also need our fellow uh, uh, brothers and sisters in humanity in the West to be clear about what they say about Islam, what they say about the religious uh, presence and the Islamic presence in Palestine, just to avoid talking about this by saying, you know, we are for the Palestinians, but we don't speak about, at the end of the day, you can be against Hamas, that's fine. You can be against what they have been doing and targeting civilians. And this is what I did 20 years ago. But at the same time, the religious 
claim about being able to live there is essential. This is from the religious viewpoint. When it comes to politics, when it comes to what we are uh, uh, expecting from the people is also to be consistent and to go as far as we can in, uh, 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 in uh, claiming that for the people in, in Palestine, it's important to have the same rights. So what and the same rights and the same uh, uh, respect. This is not what we are doing. So there is a double standard. You have been, you know, criticizing this for years in the UK. And we all know that now it's very difficult. And then what we also have to ask is for China and for Russia and for other countries. And I'm sorry to say, and this is quite clear, the more courageous governments in on earth today are coming from Latin America. They are very far, but they are the, the ones saying, we are cutting from, with Israel. We don't want this. So they are very courageous. Let us come together and, and, and ask for uh, equal religious rights, equal civil rights, and to stop this double standard and the way uh, uh, the Americans, and even in the UK and France and European countries are accepting today uh, to uh, support Israel and having domestic policies that are showing this day in and day out. So this is why we have to come together. If we don't understand in the West where we are, that what is happening in Israel has a direct impact on how we are treated as citizens, how we are treated as Muslims, how we are treated as resistant to the logic coming from the United States of America. We are, we are being so naive. So, so I think that we have to, 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 to we, we need to show courage in the way we are uh, dealing with this issue by, by not only opposing Israel, but proposing something for the Palestinians and for the people from all the religions over there. In Britain, uh, despite the rhetoric of some ministers, the hideous uh, front uh, of newspapers and television, uh, millions of people have marched for justice uh, every weekend somewhere in Britain. There is a big demonstration that every other weekend uh, there are hundreds of thousands on those marches. They pass peacefully. But when I look at the campuses in the United States, when I look at what happened in Amsterdam, lovely, cuddly Amsterdam, one would have thought the very... Uh, the, the very ideal of uh, liberal Western society, where hundreds, if not thousands, of students were literally clubbed to a pulp uh, this week. These Western countries in the United States, in Western Europe, slightly less here in Britain, are really showing themselves for what they are, are they not? Yes, you are right. I think that what is happening in, in, uh, in Palestine, what is happening today in the West is just revealing, unfolding the reality of what uh, uh, politics is all about. We are talking about liberal democracy, that you are free to say whatever you want. No, you are free to say whatever you want as long as we accept that there is that you are within uh, uh, the acceptable from the, the government. So, yes, it's revealing and it's revealing in France where the demonstrations were prohibited for m m weeks and months. And, and, and it's clearly you can't speak. You can't just, if you say I'm supporting the resistance, you could be you could be sent to court because you are supporting terrorism. So supporting the Palestinian resistance is supporting terrorism. So when you are at that point where there is the, the freedom of expression is is really on the ground prevented from being uh, a, a reality for citizens. This is the, the, the case. So you have, you know, the point is that in the UK it's slightly less, as you said, but you can see the logic. So speak out, demonstrate, but at the end of the day, we are going to do whatever we want. We are going to carry on selling weapons. We are going on uh, promoting a specific relationship with Israel. So demonstrations are necessary, but it's not enough. Now we have to, we need voices. It's revealing for all of us. We need to understand that just to be uh, uh, and to live in the West and to deal with Western governments means today that you need to get something which is more from uh, beyond demonstrations. What is your political statement? What is your political stand? What is 
what you want and what are you going to deal with the next elections to make it clear for these politicians that they are not going to win if they don't listen to the streets and they don't listen to us. But for this, we need to have a, 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 a vocal presence. We need to call for the silent majority to stop being silent and to stop buying what is uh, 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 sold to us, which is, you know, this is democracy and whatever you want to say, you can say. That's not true. The reality is that you can't and that you are very, very quickly uh, uh, pointed out as, you know, uh, an extremist, an Islamist, or an anti-Semite. So this is why we have to, 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 to. Now, as you said, it's a revealing process for our society. So what are we going to do out of this? And 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 I would say that uh, there is there are many voices, but not enough leadership in the way we are proposing something for uh, our political realities in the West and solutions in the Middle East. Final question, uh, Professor. It's a simple one-word question. Why? Why are the Western governments, societies, academia, mass media, and so on, why are they sacrificing that which they said was unique about them for a country thousands of miles away, a small country, seven million citizens? Why are they sacrificing? all that they claimed to hold dear for Netanyahu. Yes, I, I think that this is the big question for all of us. And, and what we can see on the ground is that there are many reasons why they are sacrificing this. Of course, there are historical reasons when it comes to what happened during the Second World War and helping to create Israel. And so they are involved in the whole process. So there is a so-called historical moral issue there that we can understand that is going on. And, and very often, uh, because of this, it's very difficult to face the criticism of being perceived as anti-Semite. But it's more than this. It's more than this with also so many uh, lobbies in the West helping Israel. And as long as you are uh, uh, talking, they are targeting you. And as for the governments, they are everywhere. So the American government, sometimes you wonder, is the American government supporting uh, uh, Israel or is Israel controlling the US government? And it's the same in the UK, it's the same in France. And we are obliged to, uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that there are so many trends and so many uh, financial uh, uh, benefits and financial uh, challenges that uh, uh, they are now supporting Israel when in, in a way where it's uh, against the logic, against even every single state uh, 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 interest. Even though, you know, you can see that even the Americans are going against their interests to support the, 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 the Israel. And this is the same in the UK. This is the same in France. So we need to understand that that there are the, 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 the reality of uh, uh, money, uh, economics, uh, the media, the media also uh, in the way the all, all what is happening, it's just unbelievable and even unacceptable to see how the media are covering the whole issue. It's as if you are covering the whole issue from Tel Aviv when you are in London and when you are in Paris. So all this is coming from uh, people who have a great influence on politics in the West, economically speaking, uh, uh, media uh, speaking as well. And for us, we need to understand, and this is very much the challenge of the year to come and it's unfolding and it's quite clear for all of us everything which is happening in the middle east has an impact on us in the west and if you don't get the interdependence of the whole the two realities uh, at the local level at the international level we are not going to deal with it the right way so i think that we need to understand this what we are experiencing as uk or european citizens or american citizens is connected to what is happening in the middle east and it's for us now to be clear that we are not going to accept this any longer professor tarek ramadan oxford university thank you for joining us it's been an honor uh, to thank you. talk with you uh, now it's your chance to question me. Of course, you are welcome to relate to anything that Professor Ramadan said or what I said in the beginning. I'm going to go to Italy. 
where, as a matter of fact, I am myself headed later this afternoon, but not to Napoli, where Carmine Tadesco has a question. Carmine, welcome. Thank you, George, for having me, and it's been a pleasure. I've been uh, following you since uh, the Iraq War and your, uh, 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 your appearance in the U.S. Congress. So it's, it's an Wonderful. honor to be on the show today. Thank you. Uh, my question is, I've been here in Napoli uh, watching this uh, genocide for uh, seven months and uh, seeing the lockstep of the politicians and, and all of the media in the support of, of Israel. And uh, the question I have is, the Jewish population in the United States amounts to 2% of the population. And how do they get this uh, political and media power? I mean, you look at the Biden administration and the uh, top uh, uh, cabinet positions, Secretary of State, Treasurer, and Attorney General. Uh, all these people are, are Jewish, and it's only 2% of the population. And also in the UK, the percentage is 0.5% of the population, yet Jeremy Corbyn, suffered nonstop anti-Semite uh, attacks uh, throughout his campaign. Uh, so uh, uh, that's my question. Yeah, well, first of all, there's no synonym, of course, between being Jewish and being a Zionist, being a supporter of Israel, some of the strongest opponents of Israel, uh, some of whom have been on this very show, are themselves uh, Jewish. And we must never allow that synonym to be established in anyone's mind. Uh, most uh, Jews may be Zionists, but many Jews are not Zionists. And most Zionists are not Jews. Some of them, in fact, hate Jews. Some of them are classical anti-Semites. Uh, the evangelical Christian uh, community, for example, in the United States, is the biggest funder of and is the biggest generator of uh, voting activism, political activism. And not only are they not Jews, uh, their belief is that if they can hurry on Armageddon, which is a real place, by the way, I've been in it, it's not that far from the Gaza Strip, that if they can hurry on Armageddon, uh, then Jesus will return, at which point in the minds of, in the theology of these evangelical Christians, the Jews will have to convert to Christianity or be murdered, be put to the sword. doesn't get much more anti-Semitic than that. Uh, so the presence of Jewish people in high office is not the problem the presence of slavish, fanatic supporters of Netanyahu and Zionism is the uh, problem. So it's not a question of numbers. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of Hasidic Jews, for example, that completely reject the existence of the state of Israel. There are hundreds of thousands of secular Jewish people who are on the marches in London with us every other week. They've actually got their own block, uh, the Jewish block for Palestinian rights, for justice, uh, for uh, Palestine. Thank you, Carmine, uh, for that call. Uh, let's go to Lizzie Barker in Suffolk. Lizzie. Good morning, George. I hope Good you morning. can hear me. Yes, very clear. Um, I've been to a few Palestine marches and I've heard some of the most vile hate speech against different groups in society and towards the UK itself. Do you think you're seen as a traitor for supporting these people? Excuse me? Repeat that last sentence again. Do you think you are seen as a traitor for supporting these people? If I was a traitor, I'd be 
in prison, not sitting in the country's parliament and giving two speeches just yesterday. Uh, the idea that supporting the Palestinian people makes you a traitor to Britain uh, is, if you'll forgive me, uh, a positively perverse idea. It is my job to advocate for justice, no matter who it's for, no matter who it's against. I've not actually been on any of these marches, none of them. Uh, so I'm not directly in a position uh, to say what is said, chanted, sung at these uh, rallies, but I've not seen any credible evidence that what you've just said is true. If it were true, there would be mass arrests of these demonstrators. And there hasn't been any arrests of any appreciable number, no charges, no conviction of more than uh, uh, literally one handful of people. Uh, so I think you're making that up, I've got to tell you. I don't know what marches you were on. I don't know what you heard, but I have a strong suspicion you're making it up because that would mean you heard things that the police didn't hear. And as the police are there in their thousands, I find that very difficult to believe. That means that you heard something that nobody picked up on video, despite everybody having a camera on their phone. Uh, because if there was such footage, uh, we'd already know about it. So I suspect you're making that up. And as to your statement, that I am somehow a traitor for supporting Palestinian rights, which I have done for 50 years, that is beneath a contempt. And I'm glad to see the back of you. Let me go uh, to Hayden Appleby, also in England, in Essex. Hayden, welcome. Thank you, George. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, I wanted to ask, as somebody who runs a kind of journalistic, more right, politically leaning, potentially podcast, but also is offering condemnation of Israel's actions right now. Um, I often notice that a lot of people potentially on that end of the aisle are or feel inclined to, quote, stand with Israel. They feel inclined to stand with the country currently committing war crimes. So I suppose my question is, how can we wake up those who are potentially more politically conservative, as well as maybe more, as you alluded to, evangelical Christians, conservative Jewish people? How can we wake them up to the reality of what Israel is doing, their actions and the military industrial complex really as a whole? It's a very good uh, question. I love your glasses, by the way, if you'll permit me. Uh, the uh, idea that uh, these America firsters, Britain firsters, have turned out to actually be Israel firsters uh, is one of the most perplexing political conundrums. As is the school of thought, and I believe in, in a hundred schools of thought contending in an environment of free speech, and free debate, let a thousand flowers bloom is my uh, philosophy, let the people pick the flowers they like and want. Uh, but the idea that these people who condemned so-called liberal, leftist crackdowns on free speech, free assembly, those who said that it was an outrage that, you know, Jacob Rees-Mogg couldn't freely go to a university campus and lay out his ideas. Those who said that uh, those who trembled and called for a safe space, uh, if they were subjected to my argument, are now themselves in the vanguard of cracking down on free speech. Those who called the liberals snowflakes have turned into the ultimate snowflakes. It's a very perplexing uh, state of affairs. Uh, as someone who is right-leaning yourself, you're probably in a better uh, position than me to answer it, 
but it at least establishes that such people were not telling the truth when they said they were America first, because they, they, they literally can't wait to hand over hundreds of billions of the American people's money to foreigners, to foreign countries, in pursuit of hopeless causes. Certainly in the case of uh, the Ukraine war, it is uh, a very good example that what we must judge is not people's words, but their actions. I don't normally let people back in, uh, but let me hear your uh, reaction, Hayden, to that, if you will. Yes, I agree, George. I think you're right. I think this is this is about individuals doing exactly what they accuse those of the on the left of doing the the virtue signaling and perhaps there's money in it but i think above all of that you're right it's there's a hypocrisy there and yeah it, it's it's really ultimately stooping to the level they accuse those against them of stooping to and so there there's there's a massive element of corruption I'm afraid so. Uh, that's the, the question that dare not speak its name, uh, of course, but thanks for articulating it. Let me go to uh, Lewis Brackpool in England, in West Sussex. Lewis, what would you like to say? Hi, George. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I must say, you're one of the very few MPs that actually have people on that may disagree with you, so my respects to that. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu has said that European countries must, quote, absorb the Palestinian population, where last week you answered this by saying that no country should and that Palestinians should be kept in their homeland, to which I agree with. However, we cannot overlook one of the biggest concerns the British people have, and it's that of mass immigration and rapid demographic changes. Uh, where do you, George, and the Workers' Party of Britain stand regarding the concerns of rapid demographic change in British towns and cities due to mass immigration? Well, I'm completely opposed to mass immigration. It uh, weakens and, uh, and can beggar uh, the countries from which the mass immigration is coming, and it uh, depresses. Uh, living standards and the possibility of advancing them uh, in the uh, host community to which the immigrants uh, come. Uh, I think uh, that the doctors that are produced by the Syrian education system should be practicing medicine in Syria. Ditto in the Ukraine, ditto in Palestine, ditto in India or in the Philippines. Uh, or in large parts of Africa, all of whom which have lost their brightest and best to mass immigration to countries like ours. So I'm opposed to it on both ends of the scale. The idea that there's anything left-wing about mass immigration is ludicrous, doesn't stand a minute's examination. Uh, if I was a trade union leader, as, as once I was, a negotiator rather, not leader, uh, if I went into the management seeking a rise for my members and the manager said, well, I've got 500 Bulgarians standing outside the gate. They're ready to work uh, for less than your members are getting now, never mind uh, what you're asking for. Uh, that would weaken me weaken the people I represent and strengthen the hand of the owner, of the manager. Now, having said all of that, and where I part company, not with you necessarily, I have no idea your political stripe, Lewis, so nothing personal in this, where I do fundamentally disagree with many on the right who pose these kind of questions, is, I believe, in absolute equality for the people who are already here. I will not accept, and would die rather than accept, discrimination, bigotry, hatred, 
against the people who are already here in our island. So the Workers' Party, since you asked about it, uh, fight for the rights of every person that is in this country and oppose uh, the demolition of our borders. Uh, we think the Royal Navy should be in the English Channel, not in the South China Sea. Let me go to uh, London, I think. Yes, Stoke Newington, where Randy Bennett is on the line. Randy, welcome. Thank you, George. Um, my question is simple. Um, how do we end the special relationship between the UK and America? I am sick and tired of being under the jackboot of America as a UK citizen? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I fought for Brexit, as you may know, uh, precisely because I wanted to be free of the jackboot of the unelected European Union in Brussels. Not so we could voluntarily roll under uh, the jackboot of the drooling imbecile uh, in the United States, in the White House, Joe Biden. As I've said many times, you know, uh, I could see how Tony Blair fell under the spell of a political giant, relatively speaking, like Bill Clinton. I could see why Harold Macmillan uh, was spellbound uh, by Jack Kennedy. But why anybody <laughs> would voluntarily follow Joe Biden over the cliff when not only has he not two ideas to rub together, but doesn't even know he's heading for the cliff. And we are all following him over that cliff. It is impossible to comprehend. Now, I, I can read body language and the language of eyes of, uh, of uh, political figures I should do, I've been in it uh, for long enough. I can see, not in Rishi Sunak, I can barely see his eyes over the dispatch box, but in the eyes of people like Macron, in the eyes of uh, people like Schultz and other European leaders, I can see how uncomfortable they are. They know that they're headed in entirely the wrong direction. They know that their public is not remotely behind them. They know they're marching to their own political oblivion. And for them, it's what I said, quoting Shakespeare at the beginning, that they are steeped in blood so far that it's difficult for them to know whether to go on or whether to go back. Thanks for that, Randy. Uh, let's go to Bournemouth, stay in England. Paul Harhan in Bournemouth. Paul, welcome. Morning, George. Uh, my question is, uh, doesn't Israel essentially represent U.S. policy in the Middle East? Sure, as it once represented British policy. The British gave away the land of Palestine to the Zionist Federation, which at that time represented but a scintilla of world Jewish opinion. Most Jews then, in 1917, were on the left, were supporters of the Bund or even the Bolsheviks. The Zionist Federation, formed in the late 19th century, represented a tiny proportion of international uh, Jewry. But when Britain promised them the land of the Palestinians, they did not do so because they loved Jews. As a matter of fact, Balfour and half his cabinet hated Jews. And the only Jewish member of Balfour's cabinet was totally opposed to the Balfour Declaration, thinking that it would leave British Jews open to allegations of dual loyalty uh, and all the rest. They gave it. They made that promise in Britain's imperial interest, not in the interests of Jews, still less the interests of the Palestinians. Now, since the Second World War, the United States has been the hegemonic 
uh, Western power, and Israel became uh, turned from what was described at the time uh, by one of Balfour's cabinet, uh, a little loyal Jewish Ulster in the Middle East, uh, it turned into an American uh, aircraft carrier as a ramp for American imperial interests in the Middle East to cause maximum weakness, division, and confusion amongst the Arabs under whose land was an undreamt of ocean of oil and then later uh, gas. So yes, Paul, uh, Israel essentially represents U.S. policy uh, in the Middle East. Let's go to Wembley in London. Zweli Gul. Zweli, welcome. Hi, George. How are you? Good, by the grace of God. Thanks for coming on. Perfect, yeah. Well, the question I wanted to know was that um, basically when you have, it's, it's kind of a twofold question. It's when you have groups like Nelson Mandela's ANC, as well as Nat Turner's revolt, which was obviously quite gruesome, um, but obviously became very vital in America's, uh, the inspiration for the civil rights movement that obviously came after. If we're looking at history, oppressed people tend to utilize extreme violence, usually rep reciprocating the same violence on a smaller scale that's been done to them. How come technology hasn't made this historical indemnity kind of obsolete? What I mean is that as we're more free and we're able to communicate more, how come these communications haven't been another vessel, let's say, for peace and egalitarianism and so forth? How come it's still extreme violence that seems to, like, um, bring attention to some of, like I'm saying, the leave, um, indemnities that some, historical indemnities that some people tend to bypass or go beyond? Well, only some extreme violence, of course, uh, Zweli. We are... Uh, we are treated to endless footage of the extreme violence of which we disapprove, and no footage at all, still less condemnation, of the extreme violence of which we approve. And this is where this, this nexus, this interconnectivity that Professor Tariq Ramadan was talking about comes in. You see, if you do not show your public what is being done in their name, in, on their dollar, on their tax, and oftentimes by their own armed forces. Britain, for example, uh, has flown over 200 missions across Gaza to uh, identify targets for Netanyahu's extreme violence. But not only has the British public not been told that, not been shown that, imagine, why didn't we see the footage of the planes uh, landing and the planes coming back? Why didn't we see interviews uh, with the RAF pilots who were doing the targeting for Netanyahu? Not only that, even British members of parliament, of whom I'm one, are not even allowed to ask that question in parliament, even though it's our base, our money, and I'm elected by our people to hold the government to account. That question, which I did get out in a speech yesterday, mainly because the chairman uh, in Westminster Hall was half asleep, uh, or he would have stopped me uh, from saying it. And anyway, I didn't pose it as a question. I stated it as a fact, for I know it to be a fact. Uh, even that even a, an MP is not even allowed to ask about our involvement in extreme violence because that extreme violence has the support openly if they have to, covertly if, as they'd prefer. It has the support of the British government, the American government, other Western uh, governments. So that's one of the casualties of this conflict that the supposed opposition to acquiring territory by force, to using violence rather than diplomacy uh, to resolve international questions, all of that is dead now and buried. That's why I asked Professor Tarek the question, 
Why did we sacrifice that which we claimed was our raison d'etre, our USP, our unique selling point? Why did we sacrifice that which some of us were brought up to believe were essentially British values? Why did we sacrifice them for Netanyahu? For a country of 7 million people, 2,400 miles away, in which we now have no interest? Why did we do that? I myself am struggling for an answer to that question. Let's go to the next caller, shall we? And come back to Pa, if we can. Elizabeth Morey in West Wales. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Hello, George. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly, ma'am. Yes. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much for all you have done in Parliament since your glorious return. Thank you. Um, Parliament was a relative desert during the years that you were away. And now you are showing MPs that it is possible to speak the truth courageously. Thank you, ma'am. Loud and clear. You know, ma'am, uh, it I only takes that. a few drops of rain on the desert to change the landscape completely. <laughs> what I need are a few more drops of rain to join me at the general election. Yes. Sorry to cut across. Please continue. Well, I hope that you get those drops and that the drops become a shower. Um, uh, I have a friend who lives uh, not too many miles away um, who is going to stand in the general election in an east, northeast Wales constituency. And I just wish her every, every luck. Uh, and, um, and I hope the, the same for all your other candidates. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at, at the general election, <laughs> I have only one message. Whoever you vote for, don't vote for any of the genocide parties. Don't vote for the Conservatives, for Labour, or the Liberal Democrats, whatever else you do. I hope you'll vote for us, but if you won't, just don't vote for genocide. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Yes. Well, I agree totally. Um, I live in a Plaid Cymru constituency. Um, I don't think I will vote at all. Um, and... Um, I agree with you that unless somebody stands up strong and clear for the right and the just, um, they're not worth a pack of beans. <laughs> so um, yesterday I listened to the wonderful debate in Westminster Hall. Um, 46 MPs spoke and there was only one bad voice among them and it wasn't an MP as such it was the minister um, who still uh, trots out the same old um, lies about um, Israel having the right to defend itself and not saying a word about Palestinians having the right to defend themselves but the, the, um, the debate if anybody wanted to look it up was, was in Westminster Hall yesterday afternoon it was a three hour debate and the, the, it was uh, in defense of an e-petition uh, asking the government, um, and this was an e-petition signed by 100,000 constituents yeah, one, up and down the land, 103,000 people signed it. A visa scheme for Palestinian refugees, the same as for Ukrainians. It's, it was a wonderful debate. Um, I just wish that all those MPs um, spoke as loud and strong in general debates in the main chamber. But uh, Yes, uh, Elizabeth, very, very thank you uh, for that indeed. I uh, was one of the speakers in that debate. You can quite easily find my speech, uh, which has been very widely viewed now. Uh, I went there not intending to speak, partly because I'm conflicted uh, about the issue. 
I don't want the Palestinian people to leave Gaza. Uh, but there are people here in Britain, citizens in Britain, residents in Britain, who are watching literally their own family members being murdered in Gaza. Now, if that had been the Ukraine, the British government would have fast-tracked not just a visa, but a special corridor at the airport, a council house, and a full package of uh, welfare for the Ukrainian refugees, but will not even allow a British citizen to get his old mother out of Gaza. The British government demands uh, that she submit herself to biometric testing just in case she's a terrorist. But of course, the ultimate catch-22 is in place. You cannot leave Gaza without biometric testing, and you can't get biometric testing in Gaza. How's that for a catch-22? The British government doesn't offer biometric testing in Gaza. How could it? It would be destroyed in an instant. So you have to go, according to the British government, to Egypt or Jordan or Ramallah in order to get your biometric testing so you can rejoin your family in England. But you can't get to Egypt. Still less can you get to Ramallah, Israeli-occupied territory in the West Bank. You can't get to Jordan. The only way there is through Israel. So a death sentence has been placed on the family members of British citizens, uniquely because they are Palestinians. It is a level of stupid vindictiveness that is very difficult to compare with any stupid vindictiveness of which this government and previous governments have been guilty. As I said to the minister yesterday in my speech, show some political nous. There are millions of British people hate you for what you are doing to the Palestinian people in Gaza. Why not at least try to mitigate it a tiny bit to allow a few dozen, a few score, maybe a few hundred, that's all it would be, relatives of British citizens who are trapped in Gaza. But so vindictive and so stupid is today's British government that as Elizabeth just uh, eloquently stated, they trotted out the same old, same old. The only way to change this is to change the politicians. You're not going to change the behavior of most of them. I live in hope for converts. The knowledge that one is to be hanged in the morning concentrates the mind wonderfully. MPs are going to be hanged sometime this year or in January next at a general election. So some of them may be persuadable uh, to meaningfully change. But if they won't change, we have to change them. Thanks for watching.